and in this second part we are going to uh, see how to uh, exploit our new knowledge of, of how to create HTTP servers uh, to implement some APIs uh, uh, for uh, that will be used by by the by the clients okay that we are been developing up to now basically our idea is that uh, um, we already have the, the React application that uh, for us it's a web front end, but maybe other types of applications, but we are not only interested in today. And we have some information into a database, some database that contains data and, the, and is the real source and the real um, place where the, um, we have the truth of the, of the data. Okay. Um, and so we want the application to be able to access this information here or maybe access some services, some computation services and whatever that uh, may, be, may be available somewhere. And uh, we need to create a glue layer that, that links the client application with some data on the server side. Um, the ideas are uh, on the client side, uh, in uh, decide an uh, uh, easy to use and a common inter interchange format for information. So the client uh, may want to speak with many different servers. Uh, they may have def different programming languages and so on. So we need a common format to exchange information. And this common format today is uh, uh, JSON. Okay, maybe 10 years ago it was XML and not JSON, but uh, let's talk about uh, current trends. So we decide that every information coming out or in the application, we want to encode it in, in the JSON format, which is a very simple format. We see one slide to understand the differences between J J JSON and JavaScript. And uh, from so the client will decide to encode every information in JSON. And we must have a, um, some sort of a server component that is able to use the web architecture which is URLs, addresses, to map them to services, to service endpoints. So we will um, call, um, we'll define a set of URLs that, don't, uh, that don't, don't correspond to web pages, but actually they correspond to remote services. And so by calling, by doing a get or a post to that uh, URL, you are actually calling a function for doing some some uh, some processing. Uh, the first step is the JSON um, notation, which is a very simple um, syntax. Uh, basically, J JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So we are, they used the, the notation for creating JavaScript objects. So braces and uh, property column value comma property column value comma like we create uh, javascript objects and they transform that into a, a common interchange format uh, a textual no? a text-based uh, common interchange format and it has a very very simple uh, syntax uh, but let's just see the example uh, basically this slide is the complete syntax of json so, okay <laughs> there's not, nothing more json may only have uh, strings numbers objects or arrays Strings are in quotes, numbers are outside quotes, objects are in braces, and arrays are in, um, in square parentheses. That's it. How we create uh, the description of some data. It's very, very similar to what we have uh, in, uh, in JavaScript, like we would create uh, uh, an object that contains one, two, three properties, and these properties are strings, uh, or are objects, nested objects, or arrays nested inside, uh, inside an object. So we already know all, all of it. There's only uh, two, three exceptions uh, to, to the rule. So this syntax is more limited, is more constrained. First of all, the property names should be quoted. So normally in JavaScript, the property name doesn't have the quote, it's just an identifier. You put the quotes only if the name has strange character in, in it. In JSON, it is uh, mandatory to quote uh, also the name of the properties. Second difference, uh, only double quotes are allowed. Uh, so uh, single quotes are a syntax error. And, I, and an error is that, that I always make hmm, because I prefer single quotes. But in JSON, you can only use uh, double quotes. 
um, third difference uh, no trailing comma is allowed so in uh, in javascript uh, maybe if you have an object with many properties you can put an extra comma here and it's easy because when you are doing cut and paste and shuffling the rows or adding a new element, having the comma there, it's easy because you don't have to, to check the, the last line uh, in a way. Okay, in JSON, this is forbidden. Okay, if you're doing uh, one of these three uh, mistakes, uh, then uh, JSON, the JSON parsers will not, uh, will not work. But apart from that, uh, we already know everything to create uh, you know, some object and represent all the properties of this object. As long as this property can be mapped to a string, to a number, to an, to an object, or to an array. So, for example, you cannot serialize something that contains a function or some other object. For example, the JGS, JGS objects cannot be stored here. They, cannot, they can be serialized to strings, and then when you are loading the JSON, you can reconstruct the object. So, but it's a very, very simple and, and fast to, to, to generate and fast to decode format for exchanging information and in javascript we have two methods for doing only two methods that you don't need anymore uh, one is a stringify that takes an object and returns a json string so a string containing the representation of the object according to this json syntax and the reverse is parse that takes a string and is assumed that string of course contains a valid json um, description and it will create an object. Hmm. Uh, this object will always be uh, an, an empty or a normal object, a non-typed object. Uh, so you cannot create object of a given type or of a given class. If you want, uh, there's a callback uh, that can take the row object and add the function prototype or class prototypes to connect it and to, to create an object with, a, with, with some type or with some methods. Hmm. But this is not something that uh, we normally do because we are just using JSON as a container for data to be shipped back and forth between the client and the server. OK, so let's go back to our idea. We encode information in JSON and we use URLs for representing services. And services, one easy way of thinking at accessing some data is having um, addresses URLs that map to the underlying data model. Uh, there's a long theory which uh, that is called that goes under the name of REST. Uh, REST you uh, you find a lot of the REST APIs, uh, which is uh, a theory that helps you to define this uh, this set of URLs. Well, today we will be very practical. We don't want to give you too much theory or too much uh, too, too many guidelines. Let's be practical. I want to access something that has uh, students or courses, for example, in, in the database. Uh, so the client would need, sometimes would need to access uh, the list of courses, for example, or sometimes you need to access a single course. So the idea is to give names, URL names, uh, to the different data types. And these data types uh, correspond to the SQL table, the database table, let's be more generic. Let's call them collections. So if I have a URL, a URL like uh, courses, that URL corresponds conceptually to the list of all the courses. So imagine you are mapping a data structure into a name. Courses is the name of the list of all the courses. Then we'll ask ourselves, what operations can we do? Which operations can we do on a list? Or some uh, data information will be a single item, a single course, a single student, a single exam. And we identify a single course by specifying the some sort of a course identifier inside the collection of courses. We put this courses slash identifiers and not just identifier because this identifier could mean different things in different contexts. So uh, a single element will be represented. We can choose to represent it as a, by appending the identifier or the specific element to the identifier of the collection where this element lives. So this is just a conventional way of giving names 
to objects into our database like a table name slash primary key hmm? uh, usually okay and what do we do with these uh, uh, urls uh, well okay uh, so if they represent some data we can do some operation data we can add a new course we can delete an exam we can update uh, we can search or whatever okay these are high level operations that we want to do on the data so once we mapped the data into URLs, we need to map the operations into uh, HTTP commands that we can uh, send to the server on these URLs that represent the data. Uh, we know uh, which are the ma main methods of HTTP. And so it's only a matter of matching the semantics of the operation that we want to do to the most suitable HTTP method that we can use for that. So, for example, uh, if I have a collection, a list of items, I could use the get over the URL that, that represents the collection. So this could be, for example, get, get uh, slash courses. And the get operation will just read the list of courses. And so we return a JSON containing the list of courses. And if we want to add a new course, it can have a post to slash courses to the URL that represents the collection. So making a post to a collection means creating a new item inside the collection, adding a new item to the collection. And of course, uh, since this is a post, the body of the post will contain a JSON description of the course that we want to add. And so uh, when we have a collection, the only operation that we can, we can do is just give me the content of the collection or add the new element to the collection itself. And then there are operations that we can do on the individual items. So if I have a single course, I want to know all the properties. And so I can do the get a get operation on a URL that represents a single course. So it will be courses slash uh, 01ABCD. If I make a get on that, then I will get uh, all the details, uh, all the properties of that course uh, uh, encoded in JSON. Or I could uh, replace the value of some element, so I can replace the name of a course or the number of students or whatever, some of the property with the, some other properties uh, using the put. So if, if I'm making a put call to the same URL here of a single element, I am replacing um, a course description with another course description of the same course. So it's a different adding one more or changing an existing one. Uh, this uh, uses put and sometimes sometimes it's also there's also another method called patch in HTTP. The theory says that we are using put if you are replacing the, all the properties and we are using patch if you are if we are replacing only some of the properties and so you don't need to provide all of them. but these are just details of how you want to specify your API. Or you can delete an element, so that the collection will have one less element. So we have some high-level operations, like you know, uh, add, delete, uh, update an element. And we are mapping them to HTTP verbs. So the combination of an HTTP method with a URL that describes a resource creates a, a, a sort of high-level description of what you want to do. And this will be the specification of our service. So if I have the website that uh, handles docs, uh, for example, we have all the operations that our web server allows uh, from a client to ask uh, to be able to query and manipulate this list or update this list. Hmm. Um, so this is another uh, uh, slide uh, uh, taken from, say, from Google, where they have a, a lot of documentation, suggestions, and guidelines how to create this set of uh, APIs um, that focuses on, on the on the presence of the body. So these are the 
five most importation or more most important or most popular function that we need to to provide so if i want to offer the list of all the elements of a given type i will use a collection url so like slash courses with a get method the request will have nobody and the response will have a list of all the resources it may be the list of only the ids or uh, a list of the full properties of uh, every object this is for me to decide or just a subset of the properties if i want to get some information about one item i could call it get item probably i will do exactly the same get method but this time i'm using a resource url so an, an element url with the specific uh, um, identifier of that element and i will get the resource description um, in this case it should be a full description um, and uh, you see that the id con is contained inside the resource remember the discussion we had before of embedding some number inside the url okay in this case we are actually embedding the id of the element inside the url okay so every url will refer to a different dog to a different course to different whatever for creating a new element we use a post to a url that represents a collection and the body we must put the resource in the into the body that is a json description of the new course or dog or whatever we are creating and uh, okay the response may contain uh, the, the the full description of this element maybe with the new unique identifier hmm, that you need uh, for updating use put or patch into the resource url so the difference between i am adding or i'm updating an element the difference will be whether we are just using the collection url or the resource url that already contains the id of the element that you want to update so this table and of course we need we need to provide the description of the new content of that resource so this is just a very sim simplified view of uh, of what we may do uh, and what we may implement of course, this um, applies to mapping the, the create, read, uh, update, and delete operations onto simple lists or collections of elements. We know that the databases are more complex than just separated tables that contain separate information. In a database, we also have uh, relationships. And uh, it's also easy to extend to relationships uh, this kind of mapping. For example, I can take an, uh, an element, an ID, and uh, add a third fragment that describes the relationship. So, for example, we have a, a new URI, URI, URI sorry, like students, the collection of all the students, slash S123456, that specific student with that ID, and that will be a single student, slash courses the list of courses that are mapped that are associated with that student so we can sort of navigate the many-to-many -many relationship of a student being enrolled in a course by taking the url of a student and appending an identifier of the collection of other entities that may be in relationship with that student and on the other hand if we take the uri of a single course and we append the slash students we can represent the list of all the students enrolled in that course so in that case making a put into one of these collection would be uh, sorry a post into one of these connection would imply enrolling a student into a course making a get into this will be making getting the list of students enrolled in the course or getting the courses that a student is enrolled into and so on so uh, if we try to think about uh, this schema we can come up with a very clear and uh, let's say um, regular set of URIs that represent different uh, collections items and relation relationships between items that are easy to manipulate using the four or five uh, main HTTP methods hmm? so this is the 
um, the, the, the basic idea about creating regular HTTP APIs. Then, as we said, if you are studying the rest, uh, they will give you <clears throat> a lot of more background of, on, on how to make a good design of those, but this is not uh, the scope uh, of, of our course here. Of course, uh, the theory goes only so far, and uh, in many cases you need to pass more information or add more switches, more details, and so on, and then, okay, no problem, we can just add a question mark and pass uh, more parameters that will be okay outside the naming schema uh, but will give information to the maybe i want to limit uh, don't tell don't give more than two resources in result uh, you, you cannot express that in the in, in this sort of a relationship uh, relational uh, say view uh, but you can add some parameters so in some cases you have the very clean urls and then some specific parameters that you add on the url uh, line um, okay. Uh, if you want to have some more idea or more details, you can maybe uh, browse this uh, design guide by, by Google. It's uh, it's a long, but it contains a lot of, of examples. Or there are ma a lot, very many design guidelines made by different companies that they all adopt this kind of uh, API uh, standards in um, in this case in uh, in their design. Okay, so. How can we apply these concepts uh, for us? Let's go to the code. Okay, uh, let's uh, go into the other folder, which is the React uh, Scores server. Okay, in this other code, uh, like uh, I mentioned before, uh, we already have some uh, database, which is the same database we had uh, at the beginning of the course. Uh, that contains a table with courses and a table with exams, okay? Uh, that are already populated with something. And we already have in this project uh, the, the DAO, the data object access object, uh, with a set of methods to um, access different types of information, okay? So we have, for example, a list courses uh, method that gives me a list of all the courses, execute this query, and the get course that given a course code will give me the information about that specific code and so on. And this information will be, of course, in the encoded as a list uh, arrays of JavaScript objects hmm, normally. So this is the code that we could have written at the beginning of the course uh, by roping to promises uh, the execution of a db.get or a db.all query in, uh, in SQLite. So nothing new in this file, okay? We already know everything about that. So uh, what can we do? Uh, the idea is that we should define the kind of uh, operations that we want to offer uh, to, um, to a client, to a possible client that needs to operate with the uh, scores uh, uh, table. And uh, uh, for example, we can define, uh, I want to have, uh, to give to our uh, client the possibility of getting the list of all the courses. We already have the client implemented in client side, and we know that at a given point we need to create a, uh, a drop down menu with a list of all the courses. So in some way, we must have the server to provide us the list of all the courses. So uh, we could have a URL like uh, API courses that will publish the list of all the courses. In the case of a get method, okay, we can re uh, uh, retrieve the list of all the courses. The request body will be empty, no request body, and the response will be a, an array contains containing a list of objects, and these objects will have the main attributes of a course, which is a code, a name, and a credits number. So it could be a um, code name GF CFU. Code name 
CFU and so on. So we want to create an endpoint like this. So response body. Hmm. Uh, this is just a readme where I try to track our design. So how can I do that? OK, let's uh, create a server. So React score server, I need to create a new file, server.js. Uh, it's already, uh, does it already exist? Okay, sorry. Uh, so I need to implement, the, to import Express. We require Express. I will uh, also import Morgan. And I implement. Okay, I create the the DAO the is already imported with the method that I need. Uh, I implement. Um, the, I create the application app equal to express const. I register Morga into this app. Use Morgan development okay and they start uh, the application uh, let me copy the line from there this one I don't want to have all the um, const Port equal to 2000. Okay, so that was easy. Just cut and paste. Uh, we can start the server. Mod not found. What did you find? Ah, SQLite 3. Sorry. SQLite 3. Express organ. And so while it's installing, okay, okay, server started, doesn't do anything, and we need to start implementing, for example, app dot. Um, what do you want to do? Okay, I, I forgot. Uh, I get on this. Uh, address API courses to retrieve the list of all the sorry the list of all the courses so get is the method we want on the API courses and then the callback request response function And what do, do, what do I do here? I don't need to process any request parameters. I don't have any. I may uh, I need to construct a response, but the response depends on getting from the DAO the list of all the courses. So I will call from the DAO the method list courses that will give me this array. Okay, the resolved courses will give me this array. So I can go here and uh, say um, DAO, uh, so courses, let. Uh, no, sorry, I cannot do that because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a promise. So I have first to call the promise DAO dot dot get no list list courses it doesn't have any parameters and it returns a promise so I should specify the then for telling what I what happens and the catch 
for telling what to do in case of an error. Okay. Uh, let me do like that so that it's more readable. Okay. So it's a, I'm, I'm using a promise. List courses returns a promise that will resolve when the query completed. This normal database code. And right now we are in the callback of a, of a get API. And when we execute this, this query for getting the list of all the courses, and if all the courses are returned, I can return them back to my client. So in this case, I would do something like uh, courses. Courses is the, remember, in the then we have a callback where the, the argument is the resolved, resolved value of the promise itself. We just uh, may return in the result as a JSON the courses object. Uh, sorry, square bracket, uh, braces. So what we are doing is that if the uh, promise is resolved, then we can return um, the JSON format of the list of courses to the caller and send JSON will uh, convert the object into JSON and uh, um, send the, the response immediately. So we are done here. Otherwise, uh, there was an error. And so we can return an error message in some way. So the response would contain an error status. Let's set a status of 500, for example, and uh, send maybe a, an error message. Send a, in the body of the response, we can have a description of the error itself. I forgot the braces. For example. So just remember, we are in a, in a promise, OK? So uh, the parameter of then is, will be the object that we go to, that we give to resolve, so the list of courses. The parameter of catch here will be the argument that we give to reject for the promise itself. So in this case, reject will contain an error coming from, from the SQL uh, the SQL call, the SQL callback. Okay. So does it work? Uh, we may try it. Uh, we may try to get this API and see what happens. Okay. So we can go into the um, React scores. HTTP localhost 3000 slash API slash courses. And this is the result that we get. So this I, I just use a URL to a curl, uh, to to query the to make that HTTP request by hand. You see that the server received that API get API courses. It was executed correctly with a 200 uh, um, status code. And this is the response that I get that from the server itself. So an array, you see that the formatting is JSON with the double quotes around the attributes and so on. Hmm? Um, we can do that also from a browser. If we go to the browser, we will point our browser to the same API. API courses, we get the same content. And uh, uh, in this case, Firefox gives us the possibility of uh, showing the JSON structure of the element. But what we, are, what we actually received was this one. And uh, the browser offers us to visualize it in a, in a nicer way. Um, there are a couple of other ways of uh, testing and debugging what we are doing. Uh, one is this, uh, I have an um, extension of Firefox, uh, which is called REST client. 
for example there are four or five of them where i can uh, choose the method uh, because from the browser itself it's very easy to do get request but if you want to do a post it's not so easy or even with URL, you, you can do a post with, with the URL uh, command, but uh, you have to format all the body, and it's, it's a mess, okay? It's a bit complicated. And so the REST client, you can specify the method, you can specify the body of the request, and you will get all the response content. So in this case, we have uh, HTTP uh, localhost 3000 API courses. We don't need to do anything else. We send the request, and uh, this uh, extension will give us, uh, will do the request for us. These are the, the header of the response, and this is the response itself, the code of the response that we can again format in the in JSON. Uh, so this is not much different from doing that by hand, but the, the real uh, need comes when we want to execute some different code, which is a post or something like that, which is impossible to do directly by the browser and very complex to do on the command line. Uh, there's also, if you, if you want, an extension, a nice extension of, um, of Visual Studio Code that is called, uh, why is that? Uh, REST, yeah, REST client, this one. Okay, there are a lot of fancy ones, but this one is a very is very simple, but it's effective. Uh, what you do is just, uh, so it's a REST client, okay? Uh, you just create a file with extension HTTP, so apis.http, for example. And it's just a text file with the extension HTTP, and you write here your API, API dot uh, courses, sorry, HTTP localhost 3000. And uh, it, it recognizes where the, the, the get address and uh, uh, it gives you this uh, button send request. If you click here, it will show you on the side, uh, you make the request and show you on the side uh, the, the, um, the result. And in this file, you can have many such requests separated by three hashes. It's a very, and each of them is independent from the others. So for example, if I am doing something like courses, with three S, you see that you can send this request, you will get an error, not found. But if you send the other request, you get the, the right one. So you can, in one file, have a list of APIs to try. And if you want to give a body or some headers, you just have to put, put the headers here, for example, content type or whatever. Uh, I don't know, text, uh, the J, the plain, whatever or some body so very here very easy you say the, the, the command the header the request headers and one one empty line and the body of the request you click on send and it does everything by you for you postman is also is another one like Dario is mentioning um, which is a, even more a bit more complex uh, there are as I said, many that I, I find this one this is nice because you have all the links here. You have to, to click it, and it doesn't have a lot of overhead of uh, uh, setting um, uh, like like the REST client. Uh, you have to select the uh, the method and so on. Hmm? But anyway, each of them will do the same job: do an HTTP request. Um, so what else can we implement? Okay, we have the list of courses. We may want to uh, implement another API. So get courses, list courses. We can implement an API for getting the information about a single course. Okay, so uh, get a course. In this case, we have an API 
where we have a parameter which is the course code we get and we retrieve the properties the attributes of the course with the specified code the request party is empty because the code is already encoded in the address and the response body will not be a list of objects but just a single object okay so how to implement this one well it's similar to the previous one so we can duplicate it and uh, say that okay the url should be uh, will contain also a third field which is the code of the course and this code can be extracted by the request from the params field remember query is the question mark and params is the column which is say internal to the api the express parsing and with this code we can use the method in the DAO, okay, get course here, that uh, um, queries for the information about a single course with a parameter code. Okay, so this is the method that we, we should call. Fortunately, we, are, we, are, we already have all these methods implemented. So we don't do, um, so uh, let us try to implement it in a different way with, with the await, which is maybe easier. So let uh, uh, course equal to await of uh, uh, await uh, DAO dot get course with code. Okay, so we don't need all this. Okay, so there's another way. Since we are doing uh, get course or returns a promise, we can uh, use the then catch syntax or we can use the await syntax as you prefer. And the problem with await is that uh, await, you see here, is only valid in an async function. Okay, uh, which already we already know it. Uh, which is the function where we await is written is this one. So we must declare that this callback is a sync. Okay, so if you see this error, await is valid in a sync function. Remember to make your callback to mark your callback for to be an async function. Okay, so right now the code is got is uh, decoded synchronously, and we do this await, and after the await we can do the um, the course object can be returned result dot json course, and so we are returning the JSON representation of the course to the client. So we may try it. We say that we want to, so let's pick one of the codes that, that's here and stick it at the end of the URL here. And if you send a request, now we are getting the information about one single course. The get, the logger says that we received this query and the result was this one, okay? So we are sort of adding an, an interface uh, layer to, to the single queries to expose this information to the client that wants uh, to access them. Um, what happens if I write a, a wrong code here? Well, uh, it's a... I get an... Uh, 200 so there's something which is not 
not really okay because I'm getting a 200 code instead of a 500 so the browser doesn't understand that there is an error and we got something which is not um, a course object but an error object the reason is that we are confusing the in the await we are confusing uh, the, the normal return code of the function with the rejection of the promise so uh, we would like uh, to uh, to catch the rejection of the promise okay remember that we are in the case that the course is not found okay this is not uh, what I like I would like to reject it hmm. reject with an error course is not found uh, not not resolving because I, uh, it, it didn't work correctly so in this case uh, sorry I, the, the API was too forgiving I click on send uh, I get a lot of errors and warning I, I don't I don't I don't get any reply and the errors and warning basically are, uh, are saying are telling me that a, a, um, a promise has been rejected but I'm not managing the rejection myself. I'm not capturing the, the rejection. So let's just remember how to manage the rejection of a, of a promise. In the case of a then catch, you just have to add the catch. In the case of an await, you have a try. You must wrap the promise code into a try statement. Try catch. And then we have the error here. And in the code for handling the catch, we may result dot status 500, and then I will give you the error message. Uh, JSON error object. Hmm? So that always remember when we are executing some database code there can always be the possibility of, a, of, a, of an error so you can detect it basically or from analyzing the object either from analyzing the, the return object or by just having um, rejecting the promise and then returning something else to the to the user and if we try it again What we get is, you see, that uh, a 500 error return code uh, with the error message inside. And uh, if we, on the other hand, have the right code, for example, this one, I get the, the, the right code. So we need to propagate the errors from the database uh, to the web server, uh, from the web server to the client, uh, that in some way will be able to detect uh, from the status code whether the operation were OK or not. And then it's all the business of the client how to show this error to the user. Uh, okay. these, were, these were easy because we were just reading information. In the first case, it was information without any parameters. In the second case, it was information with some parameter. We could also decide that we need to do some validation here. For example, here we are just trusting this code and we are giving the code directly to the database code to the DAO maybe we could add some value if you want you can add some validation function here to ensure that the code has the proper length for example or only has alphanumeric uh, uh, characters or whatever you want okay um, but the more interesting part comes when we are trying to implement uh, so validation can be done can be added here we don't have just the time today during the, the, the class because I want to go to the more interesting uh, for example do we have an API for adding an exam or for listing the exams okay uh, let's try to add an exam so uh, we could have uh, of course we could list exams uh, will be just a copy and paste of what we are doing with the courses or we can get an exam with just a cut and paste 
very easy no uh, the, the same code that we are doing for the courses adding a new exam uh, means uh, uh, adding something to a collection is a post operation onto a collection URL hmm? so for adding a new exam we should accept um, post course on a API exams endpoint address and so at this point the request body is not empty but will be the object describing a single exam and so what are the properties of a single exam uh, they are the um, uh, course code score and date code score and date Okay, and the DAO also already have, we have a method for adding an exam that will expect that code, date, and score. Right? So we must add an object with code, score, and date. Maybe we can make it. And the response will be empty. We don't need any response. Or an error, of course. Okay, so in this case, how to implement that? We need to implement for the first time a post, app.post, .post, onto an API, which is the collection URL for uh, the exams. Async request response. And inside here, we have uh, to extract the information about uh, the exam, which is in the request body in JSON format. So remember that for extracting information in JSON format uh, in the body of the request, uh, we must install a middleware for parsing the body in uh, JSON. So after we use Morgan, we also use express.json okay for parsing the body in json format and so it will populate the uh, the uh, response request dot body attributes hmm. okay so let's since we have installed this uh, right now this middleware we find uh, we will find uh, the three attributes uh, uh, code uh, course uh, and um, and uh, date as attributes of the body okay if otherwise uh, request the body will be empty will be all the attributes will be undefined so we may have uh, uh, the code we, we may read it from the request dot body dot code uh, the uh, score is from request dot body dot score and uh, the data will be a string from request dot body dot date and we can call the DAO with the method add uh, what was the name create create exam create exam with an object composed of these three attributes okay so code code score score there are shorter ways of, of writing that of course but just for the first time we do all the steps date date and this uh, will ask the database to do the query we would we could be tempted to close the response here 
okay okay we, we are done we are closed we 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 ask the DAO to do the query and the query can will go on asynchronously but in the meantime we can tell the browser that we finish our job uh, and we close the connection but maybe it's not the best choice because the query could generate some exception some error and so we want to be able to catch the errors to tell the browser that something went wrong okay otherwise remember that this will be will, will be executed before the end of the query because it's all asynchronous code here uh, so I want, okay, let's not, 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 not to be too optimistic, let's not rush. And so let's uh, try, put a try catch block here. And see what, what went wrong. Okay. Uh, and we can wait for this instruction so that we can close uh, uh the 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 request only when the create exam promise has been completed and fulfilled in a positive way so the await will make it wait until the database tells me okay everything is okay and if, if something's wrong okay i can tell the errors arrest dot status 500 dot uh, uh, send the error object to the browser Okay. Uh, Alessio is asking why we are using the JSON middleware. The JSON middleware is because the body of the of this uh, post call will contain some JSON object, and by default the body is not parsed, is not read by Express, and so these properties will be empty. Uh, the JSON middleware will read the body of the request and will create these properties for us to read. Okay, so otherwise these three properties will not be there. Hmm? They, they, they are created by the JSON middleware. Um, Lorenzo, should we close it also in the case of error? Yes, but send already closes it. Hmm? Send, uh, send and JSON methods already close the connection send is like oh sorry it was not send but it was json send expects a string and json expects an object and what that will be serialized to a string so does it work i don't know we may try it with the uh, rest client for example this time we want to send a post to exams with a body that was should be an object contains a code uh, sorry the post syntax is always hitting me double quote code um, ABCD uh, or 99 ABCD -E. then we have the score double quote number 30 then we have the data which is 2021-0506 okay uh, in uh, postman uh, sorry in rest client uh, you have to specify that the you have a, a header uh, and, uh, a request body of type json uh, remember in the headers here if you are using rest client in firefox uh, you can use uh, application slash j you must specify the header application.json this is what will trigger the this header here is what will trigger the json middleware in express and so we'll make uh, express read and uh, process this this part if you forget uh, the header then you will not find the the, the data in the server side okay Let's try to do that. Your request has been processed successfully. The response is empty, headers 200. So it was very fast to tell me, OK, it, it was done. Was it really done? Well, we can check the exams on the database directly. And we see that this new exam now appeared here. OK, 
So we, we actually saved the exam there. If I want to try it a second time, okay, I have, okay, there's a problem because the we have the uh, status, oh, status code 500. So this is an error. And the error is uh, some SQLite constraint. What happened actually is that I was trying to add another item with the same primary key. So I'm having a primary key violation into my database. Of course, the, the error message could be better. Uh, we could, uh, of course, try to predict the errors and write. Uh, uh, but the important thing if I, right now is that we catch the error. We don't confuse it. When we say this morning that the post is not idempotent, is that because I'm trying to do the same post twice and the second result is different from the first one because in, the, in this case we are violating a constraint in the database. Uh, it's modifying the database, so um, it may happen. If we want to try the same in um, in the in the here in the in the Visual Studio Code REST client uh, post HTTP localhost 3000 API exams exams. Um, sorry. Then I, I need to add the content type application slash JSON and then an empty line with the JSON itself. So I can copy here and change the code 33. 21. Let's change something so that we see it works. Okay, so this is the way of making post requests. And you see that the browser tells me 200. Okay, In, and if I check the database, the, where is that SQLite? We see that also the new one was inserted. Of course, we don't have the get exams. Otherwise, I would just uh, would uh, it would be very easy to check uh, the get exams uh, to see the new content of the of the um, of the collection. Okay, so this is the kind of code that we are uh, we are implementing. First of all, we need to think about uh, which are the services that my server wants to offer to the client. And basically, it will be the basic operations, list, read, create, update, and delete. Maybe not delete. We don't like to delete things. But uh, these five main operations over collections. In a collection, I can list the elements or I can add a new element. Or over items. And an item can be uh, read or modified or deleted. Basically, we have these five operations on each, each type of object that our database uh, supports. These are the basic functionalities. And we see that they are implemented uh, basically at two levels. The first level is the HTTP level, where we uh, get the route, uh, extract the parameters, uh, do some validation that is missing right now, and then execute the, the operation at the database level. And then the, the, the second level will be the database level that we already know from, from the beginning of the course, where we do the query and check for the errors. Again, we go back to the HTTP layer and check for the errors and build the response that could be a success response or an error response to the HTTP, response, uh, to the HTTP request. That's all for the basic request. And then maybe we have some extra requests like uh, filtering, like uh, limiting the number of results, like changing the format or whatever. And at that point, we will add new uh, routes with the question mark with extra parameters or just new routes uh, that don't follow this rule because uh, uh, maybe the logging operation doesn't, it doesn't fall into these five uh, um, uh, these five uh, categories, for example, no? not easily. So we may, these are just the basic rule. Then you can define uh, your own uh, APIs. And this will be ready for uh, the client to, to call. So next week, what we will do is uh, 
uh, to see how the client can call these APIs and how this data can be inserted into the, the client application. Uh, what we didn't do today for reason of time is adding the, the validation part, but in the code that we are going to push on the, on, um, on GitHub, we will, you will also have the example with the validation library that will try to validate uh, the different parts of the parameters that we are extracting from the code. And so we can remember just to have a look at that code and also you can use it for, let's say, cut and paste for your own code because more or less all of this is, the, is always very, very similar. All of these methods are very similar to each other. What changes are the parameters and the type of errors that may happen. So for example, in a post, you must check for the duplication. In a get, you must check whether the element exists and so on. So there are different types of, uh, of errors that you must check every time. Okay, uh, before closing, Yasser is asking when the Big Lab 2 will be released. Uh, we'll start on Monday. So we have to, to submit the Big Lab 1 by the end of this week. And the labs of, of, of next Monday will uh, already be on the first half of Big Lab 2. The, tax, the text should be probably uh, be published on, on Friday. So you have a couple of days before. And it will take the next four weeks. Okay. Any other questions? So I am commit the joke, the code, you may enjoy creating services for your application. The first step of Big Lab 2, of course, will be doing this very job onto the um, task list. Okay, so it will be uh, actually the continuation of what we are doing here. Okay, so thanks for everything and uh, see you next week. Bye bye.